So my wife left Friday for Italy for a month, probably. My daughter's having surgery, so please pray for Nikki. She's been sick, if you know, for probably a year now. Finally, they're going to do the surgery, kidney surgery, and fix the problem. Hopefully, if they don't fix it the first time, they said they have to go back two weeks later and do another one. So pray that works. But, you know, when the wife's gone, I kind of get in the fix-it mode. Yeah, I got this big list. But well, one of the things that I really, really wanted to fix while she was gone is we have this problem with our Wi-Fi router. It doesn't get to the bedroom, which is a few feet away. And, and then what really triggered it was my security system is plugged into it, and it gives me this error code. It's been on here for years. It gives me the error co code that says... You need a firmware update. What in the heck is a firmware update? I have no clue. So I was getting so sick and tired of this router. So I thought, I am going to go get me the biggest, the baddest, the best bias, best bias thing I can get, router, modem, and hook it up to my house so I'll have, you know, make your hair stand up when you walk by it. I want that. So I go to Best Buy and look at all the stuff they have, and I find one, the perfect one. This box says right on it, compatible, guaranteed with Spectrum. That's my provider. So I said, okay, $200? Is it going to do dishes for me while my wife's gone? $200? So I'm thinking, okay, I, okay I'm going to buy the bullet here because I want something that works. We don't have cable TV. We just have Wi-Fi in the house and the phone system. So you want it to work right. I want the security system to work right. So I got to understand, I live towards Red Springs, if you know where that is, going out of Rayford. So I live pretty far away. This is not like go down the street and get something coming back. This is like a long trek all the way to Best Buy. So I go to Best Buy, and I buy it, and I get out of there. It says guarantee. I take it back home. I hook it up. But here's the deal, guys. I follow the directions line by line. I know how that stuff works. By line, the passcode, the and Mac code, all this code, put it all in, get it hooked up. And it says, wait for the light, the light will flash, and then it'll, then it'll come on and stay on solid. That light never came on. <laughs> so that meant I had to call Spectrum. I spent an hour on the phone, an hour with Spectrum, with their tech support services to fix my fancy $200 modem. And they, she had me reboot it. You have to wait 10 minutes. Another reboot. Over an hour. Like, I'm glad my wife was gone. I had nothing else to do, right? She said it doesn't work. I'm no joke. $200. Well, I mean, it doesn't work. Well, it's not picking up our stuff. It says on the box, guaranteed spectrum compatible. Well, it's not working. Besides, you don't want that one anyway. Anyway, I said, what? I spent $200. What do you mean I don't want it? She said, because you have the phone system. In order to have the phone system with the Wi-Fi system, you got to keep your own modem. And you got to get a splitter cable. I said, what? I said, can you just hook up the old one? Just hook up the old one. I, I don't like it when things don't work. Do you? I don't like it when it doesn't work. You know, we had problems today. Somebody here got shot in the eyes with a light going right through your face. Somebody got a sunburn this morning. That light, uh, light bulbs. I, I just don't like it when things don't work. My, my computer program went down in the first service. I don't like it when it doesn't work. But I have a God, you have a God, and he has designed the universe, and he keeps it working. And I am so glad that it kept working when my wife was flying 35,000 feet over to Italy that he didn't sneeze or hiccup in that plane fall into the ocean. Because God is in control, and he does not miss a beat. A verse of scripture I think is really important for us to know. This is the God I serve. I don't know which one you're serving, but this is the one I serve. His name is Jesus, and look what it says about him. He delivered us from the kingdom 
domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus, all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, the visible, the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or authorities or powers, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things work, all things hold together. Your life, if you're giving your life to Christ, is held together by the power of God. And our world, our physical world was created by the Holy Spirit who spoke this whole thing into existence. So we're here today, we're talking about how that really works. We're gonna talk about some things. That's kind of funny, because when I was doing this sermon series, uh, I, it takes me a while to do them. So I got this on my computer screen, I'm working with it. And a couple years ago, I had a medical incident where I had to give up sugar and everything. Anyway, so donuts are not on my list. So I'm looking at donuts all day, every day, making my sermon. And now that's a joke. See, this sermon series was prepared or planned out months ago, and I drew the lucky straw. You know what my topic is today? God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> Donut, lead us into temptation. Don't lead us into temptation is the verse. This is taken from what we call the Lord's Prayer out of Matthew 6, 9 through 14. If you have your papers out, you might want to write fast. Um, I didn't even get all the way through it in the first service, but you guys got a little more time. Besides, you got nowhere to go, right? Unless you're coming to the starting point class. Class two today, by the way. I want to say a shout out to my brother, Chuck, and his wife, Brenda, in Kentucky. They're on, watching Facebook right now. They've joined the church. He has a, had a brain injury, and he's not able to go to church, so he, they watch church. They have church with us today. So hi, Brenda. Say hi, Brenda. Hi, Brenda. <laughs> hi Chuck. <laughs> Great people. Love technology when it works. Now, this particular scripture, the backdrop to it is this. Uh, in the chapter 6, Jesus told them everything they're not supposed to do. I don't want you to pray this way. I don't want you to act religiously. I don't want you to be a hypocrite. I don't want you to announce when you're fasting. I don't want you to, to, to show off in front of other people with your religiosity because it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. And when you pray, I want you to go in your inner room. And when you pray to your father, pray to him in secret secret, your father who sees you in secret will repay you. But if you don't, and you're trying to be religious, you've already got your reward. And I don't know about you, but I want the reward from him. So that's the backdrop to this particular prayer. So when Jesus comes to pray, I want you to notice a couple things. He said, don't do it this way. Don't do it according to religion. Don't do it according to rites and codes and all that. Do it because it's a relationship. Remember, it's a relationship. So he says, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Most of you prayed this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, let me say something about this because some of you are scratching your head. This is a New American Standard. It's a Bible that I use. The word debt here in the Greek is the word debt as it comes in a monetary form. It's not just about money, but that's the root of that word. It does work with trespass. Same thing. Somebody takes advantage of you, trespasses with your wife, whatever. It means the same thing. Just so you don't get confused. I like the word trespass myself. It just flows better. You know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Debt and debtor is a little harder to say, but that just, just for free. That's for free. This portion is how to pray. And he says this, do not lead us into temptation. Remember, you have a relationship with God. Do not, God, lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So he sandwiches kingdom authority on the top and the bottom. And in the middle, he talks about some very, very important concepts about your relationship with other people and with God himself. But doesn't it kind of create what I call a little cognitive, mm, what do you mean do not lead us into temptation? It sounds like God's grabbed my arm and taken me along, and then he throws a banana peeling when I'm not looking to see if I slip and fall. You know, that's kind of the feeling of that. 
And I know they can't be true. That's not the God I serve. And, and the principle of hermeneutics, the science of interpretation, goes like this. These fuzzy scriptures are ones like, that's just kind of at me. You need to take other scriptures to understand what it means. I want to talk about this because this has been an issue last year in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, Pope Francis said, people are getting confused with that. They think that God makes them trip and fall and kind of messes, puts them on, shoves them off cliffs and stuff like that. So he rewrote it. I'm like, who does he think he is, the Pope? Yeah, he rewrote it. And he wrote it to mean something a little different. Now, I can't imagine if you're a Catholic and you recited the Our Father all these years and he changed the words of the Our Father, it kind of mess you up. You got to relearn the thing. But it's so critical to the Christian life. There's something he missed, I believe. I think he got the correct interpretation for sure. But the, the fear in our hearts that God does that to us? No, no. Do not lead us in temptation. So I went back to the Greek. I thought, okay, what's the Greek say? I want to know the original language, not the Latin, not the Vulgate. I want to know what the Greek says. And it literally says, do not bring us into temptation. Do not lead us into temptation exactly word for word in this order, which Greek always ends in the right order, and deliver us. And that word there is the word picture of rescuing someone out of a river. Deliver us out of evil. So both words, and the key word here is lead, not, not temptation. It is lead. Do not lead us, but deliver us from the water, the river of evil. What is lead? Well, what's the word we get leadership from? What is leadership? Everybody here has leadership of some kind. Leadership is influence. That's its basic definition. You influence people, you lead them. So in this particular part, we're going to see this in a minute, what Jesus is saying, ask your father to bring the influences in your life to lead you away from temptation. Influences, leadership, not lead me, pull me by the hand, but God, I want influences in my life that keep me from getting into temptation. When you look at this particular passage of Scripture, a couple things come to mind that we are susceptible to temptation and that it is a very, very important concept for Jesus Christ to actually tell us to pray this prayer. Now, the doctrine of sin, let's cover this really briefly. I can't do all of it, but let's just do the basics on the doctrine of sin. The Bible teaches us that in the Garden of Eden, man was pure, right, didn't do anything wrong. God gave one commandment, do not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat knowing about good and then knowing about evil. It's kind of like, do not look at the internet, okay? And, oh, I got to see what this says. What is that? Oh, wow, look at that. They, they did that. They disobeyed God under one commandment. In that moment, they all died, or they died, and we all died in him because he's our grandfather, our great, 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 great grandfather. He's the father of all mankind. It's called headship. What the father of the home does really affects the home, doesn't it? Well, what he did, it says in the Bible that his sin, his disconnection from God by disobeying God went to all mankind. Therefore, all have sin. So we get what we call imputed iniquity. Iniquity that came from him. But that's not the only place we get sin from. We get sins generationally, generational curses. We have, you look at family, sometimes you'll have an alcoholic dad, alcoholic kids, their grandfather's an alcoholic, everybody's an alcoholic, the dog's an alcoholic. It's just a generational thing. Or divorce, it just runs through the family. And you can break those curses, but that sin, that environment has led the next person down the road of temptation. And of course, it's the unrighteousness that we have in and of ourselves. You might think that you don't have any sin, but anything that is contrary to God's word that does not bring it in a correct alignment in your life, it's not standardized by the Bible, is sin. Okay. The sin that we have leads us to what I call the mechanisms of temptation. Fulton writes this. We are not masters of our feelings. You ever, you ever told your wife this, guys? What do you mean you feel that way? Don't feel that way. Is that helpful? You go to your husband and say, oh, I really feel down. I don't, know. I don't know what's wrong. I just don't know. Well, don't feel that way. That's what guys do, right? We just ignore our feelings. 
We, we cannot turn those switches on and off. Let me give you a little help here. You can't tell your wife, don't do that. She feels that. So you got to explore that a little bit. You know, you got to be, a, you got to man up a little bit, under, uh, dwell with your wife in according to knowledge. The Bible says, the Bible says that you're supposed to lead the wife, not her, you. So you're supposed to understand her. So they don't say, well, don't feel that way. Can you imagine how much counseling I get done? Well, don't feel that way. There's a reason you feel that way. So you cannot master your feelings. You don't know what those are. You don't know where they come. Guys, they come from all different places. But we, we do control our consent. What we do with our feelings, we do control those. I think of it like this. Whatever we put our attention to leads us in that direction. So if you entertain a negative feeling, guess what direction you're going? Conversely, if you put your attention towards the right direction, it will lead you that way. So lead us not to temptation could be like, okay, Father, help me give my attention to the proper places so that I will be led that direction. Because you're being led. Either by your emotions, you're being led by your, your body, your soul, you're being, low, you're being led by that. So James 1, 13, 15 says this. Let no one say, and here's the verse of Scripture that balances or actually gives clarity to what he says, what Jesus said. Don't let anybody say that when he is tempted, that he's been tempted by God. God doesn't tempt people. God can't be tempted by evil. Matter of fact, one of the uh, Latin translations in Italy for this word is, Lord, do not submit yourself to temptation. Well, God can't submit himself. to. He's not tempted by evil, so that's not the right that is not the right interpretation. He himself does not tempt anyone. But what happens? Each one is tempted when he is carried away, when he is influenced and influenced, enticed by his own flesh. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin accomplished, it brings forth death. Temptation and standing against temptation and learning how to grow up in that area keeps you out of death. Spiritual death Emotional death, relational death, psychological death, harm. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says this through 27. Paul's talking, great man of God. He says, don't you know that everybody runs a race, but not everybody gets a prize? Run in such a way. In other words, whatever you do, do it in such a way that you win. You're in this thing to win. In this such a way is actually God's design. So run according to God's design that you might win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control. Now we could use a different word. I call it self-regulation. A person who is spiritually mature has the ability to self-regulate. And that's not, that's not willing yourself. That's not making sanctification. It is, it is doing something with self. It is regulating it. And I'm going to show you how to do that. It is not, I just want to do what's right. It is not. Now think about this. This man, Paul, who wrote this at the very end of his ministry, he's already planted churches. He's preached the gospel with power. He's just an awesome guy. And it, he's got like three PhDs, and he's, he's been a Pharisee of Pharisee. He's done everything according to God's will. As a matter of fact, he, cruci he, he persecuted the church of Jesus Christ because he felt like it was a cult. He was zealous for God. Even if he was incorrectly zealous, he was still zealous for God. And then God knocked him off his high horse by blinding him and raising him up and take, healing his eyes. This is not a neophyte Christian, but listen to what he writes. At the end of his ministry in Rome, he writes this. I am not practicing what I would like to do. See, some people think you can just will to do it. I'm just going to will to be a good person. How's that working for you? I'm going to will to be a good husband, a good wife. How's that working? Don't poke each other. I do the very thing I hate. If I do the thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law. I agree God's, with God's word. I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to do this other thing. He goes on and says, I recognize sin, I recognize evil is in me, in my flesh. The willingness is, is present in me, but there's a gap between what I will to do and what I end up doing behaviorally. There's something, that I, there's something gap there, and I'm struggling with the gap. For the good that I will to do, I want to do it, I don't do it. But I practice the very evil I don't want to do. It says, I joyfully concur with God in the inner man, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
But there's a different law in the members of my body makes me a slave. Said, who will save me from this physical body of death that takes me and influences me the wrong direction? Can you imagine Apostle Paul coming to Rockfish Church wanting to be a pastor? He applies, you know. Well, I don't know. Let me see your resume. Whoa, pretty impressive. You wrote most of the Bible. Cool. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I do preach with power. I preach with power. Um, uh, but some people say I'm hard to understand. Now, this is his words. Um, some, I don't put words together well. I got run on sentences. My handwriting, I can barely read it. It's barely legible. I'm over 50 years old. I've never preached in one place more than three years at a time, and most of the churches I've been serving in are very small churches. In some places, my ministry has led to riots and disturbances. I've been jailed on several occasions. My health is not good. I've been known to knock heads with colleagues, and I found that some people, I just can't work with them. I forget who I baptized, and I don't have a permanent dress. Now, let's hire that guy. Now, who would hire that guy? On, based on that, to be like, wait a minute. But this guy is, is a solid believer who did most of the New Testament, who allowed the evangelical movement, if you will, across Asia, all the way to Rome. This guy, he says, look, I'm not all together. Plus, you're actually a high liability if that's your resume. You don't want to tell everybody that. So they don't receive a perishable wreath, but imperishable. Therefore, what he says, I run the way I do my life. I run not without aim. I got a purpose in what I do. I have a purpose in what I do, and I box in such a way I don't beat the air. But I discipline, which is not a pretty word. This word actually in the Greek means to bruise yourself. That's why the early church fathers would take whips and whip themselves to make themselves straighten out. How many people know that doesn't work? Okay, it doesn't work. That's not exactly what he's talking about. But he says, I make my body, I take my body and make it my slave. What he's saying here is, I've learned to tell my body no. What? You know in our culture, in our day and time, that we have a very difficult time telling ourselves no. My brother was telling me that one of the doctors told him that what he has to tell his body, tell himself, no. What? When you don't feel like getting out of bed, your, your brain doesn't feel like it should work, you tell your body, no, we're getting up and going. We're doing this. We're making ourselves, that's called self-control, self-regulation. We have a very, very poor track record as a culture to say no to the fifth bowl of ice cream or the fact that we want to run somebody off the road. We just don't like to tell ourselves no. And fi finally, we kind of think, well, that's kind of weird to tell myself no, but that's exactly what Paul's saying. I discipline myself to bring my feelings and whatever it is, the things that I hate, I bring them into subjection. It's like building muscles. You know, when you build muscles, you lift weights, your, your arms, you tear the muscles to make them grow. You bruise your body. You make your body do what it's supposed to do to get the result you want. If you don't hurt your body in this disciplined fashion, you never gain weight. You never gain muscle mass. You just deteriorate. You have to tell yourself no. All right. After I preach then, I myself might be disqualified. In other words, not that he's going to burn in hell, that I didn't win according to the life design of God. God designed the body and the soul and the spirit to work a certain way. And he, he says, I want to do it by the design. It's accomplished by the way God made it. Because God's ways work, don't they? God's ways work. They do. So we're going to talk about spiritual formation. Understand this. It is impossible to totally separate the spiritual, the emotional, and the physical realms. You can't separate. You're a tripartite human being. You have three parts. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Those three things, and there's a little bit more com compartments to that, but those three major things are sometimes in conflict with one another, and they do affect everything else in your body. So what you, what you do, how you act, how you respond, your stress levels, all those things affect your spirit too, affect your soul. How many people here have been told, you can raise your hand, there's no HIPAA law against this. How many people here uh, believe or have been told you have high cholesterol? Lots of people. How many people here have been told you have low cholesterol? Anybody? You have? We say, well, what's the deal with that? Low cholesterol. 
as a pastor, when someone comes and talks to me in counseling, and I say, I, I have suicidal thoughts. I have suicidal thoughts. I am depressed. Low cholesterol, just that one thing, low cholesterol in your body, which sounds like a good thing, but when it drops below 150, you are in a higher risk of getting depression. And the type of depression that you can get is called fractional depression, which is a psychological problem because fractional depression does not respond to any therapeutic methods at all or medicine. So somebody comes to me and says, I got suicidal thoughts, I'm depressed, I think a demon's after me. I'm like, wait a minute, what's your cholesterol level? They'll look at me like, what? No, it's connected. It is all connected. Don't hyper-spiritualize everything till you know that's what it is. The body is connected to the soul. It's connected to the spirit. It's all connected. It all influences. But it does not connect physically. And I'll show you that in a second. So spiritual formation is how do we cooperate with God's design in every area of our life to make us to be able to say no to our body and yes to the spirit. Remember it says in Rome, if you sow to the flesh, what happens? You die. If you sow to the spirit, what is that? That is discipline. That is spiritual formation. James chapter 4, 7 through 8. Here's the key. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's a lot in that. But here's the spiritual formation formula, if you will. You must submit to Christ, number one. You've got to know Jesus. But if you know Jesus, you must submit to his word. To say, I agree with the word. You've got to be like Paul. I don't do what I'm supposed to do, but I agree the word's right. Resist the devil. This is something that has to do with your character. It's your character. Submitting to God is an act of humility. It's saying, I am not right, you are right. It is saying, your word is true, I am a scumbag, if you have to say it that way. I'm submitting to you, it's an act of humility. Resisting the devil is the act of character. Nobody goes around acting like, well, some people do. Don't act all out of moral character in front of other people. They usually do it in secret. People that have affairs, they do it in secret. That's a character issue. So when you resist the devil, it is about character. Draw near is an action. This is very important. This is actually the key. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God is when you give your attention and your affections towards God. It works like a magnet. The closer you get to God, boom! The closer you draw near to God, he promises to be there. He promises to give you power. You must draw near to God. So we're going to talk about how do you do that. That is literally the act of attention and affections. If you have a wife that you're really not caring a lot about, start treating her like she's your wife. Whether you feel like it or not. Tell your body, no, you're not going after that young thing. This is your wife. Treat her like your wife. Give her attention Affection will follow, and your marriage will automatically improve. If you treat her like she's special, guess what will happen? You'll feel like she's special. We always tend to do it backwards because we don't tell ourselves no. Purify your hearts is an act of emotions, and we don't go into all that, but that's a residual effect of what we're talking about today. Cleansing your hands is the idea of an act of obedience, being obedient to God. Cleanse your hands. Do what God tells you to do. But you can't do that without your heart in line with what God's saying. Double-minded. We'll talk about this is exactly what Paul was talking about. I do the very thing I hate. The one thing I want to do, I don't do it. This is, you feel this. I feel schizophrenic sometimes. I want to do that, but I end up doing this. I, I, I'm double-minded. If God be God, serve him. And it's easy to say, let's just will yourself to do that. But the problem with the will is it can't do that. You cannot will yourself to do anything. You can't. But you can use the will for something. And I'll show you what that looks like. This particular term, you can write it down and some nerds like it. If you like it, you're not a nerd. But I'm a nerd because I wrote it. Reciprocal cybernetic interactional induction. What this literally is, the dynamic between the body, the soul, and the spirit. The body, soul, and the spirit is not connected like a tinker toy. It has influence on each other, but it is not touching each other. Your soul does not touch your physical body, literally. Your spirit doesn't. What it is, it is a term or a hypothesis that talks about this interaction effect. 
Now, a hypothesis is things like this. Okay, some people believe, and I don't know because I can't decide, dissect your consciousness, but they believe there's a force in your consciousness called psychons, which are particles of consciousness. They're energies. Everything's energy. You understand that. Everything in the universe is energy. The spirit is energy. The Holy Spirit's power. He's energy. Uh, the definition for power itself is, is work over time and distance over time. But this idea that there's some connection there is what I want you to get, not what you have to call it. Your emotions are connected too. There's a whole range of new scientific evidence that shows that your emotions can affect you physiologically, not only spiritually. There's molecules of emotions, if you will. When you feel something, when you engage in something, it releases molecules into your body that starts doing things. You're connected, not just by the spirit, but by the soul and by your body. Now, this particular term that I gave you is, uh, it's kind of defined the separate proximal but parallel systems that control forces interacting between the body, soul, and the spirit. Cybernetics is basically systems control. So this, this means they're, they're close, but they don't touch. It's not like it's the body is separate from the soul and the soul is separate from the spirit. Some people think it's the spirit and the soul is the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. The Bible says I can, I can take the word of God and divide between the bone and the marrow and the soul and the spirit. I can tell you the difference. There's a difference between the soul and the spirit. So let's look at this. To break it down in easier form influences in your life, your personal life. I'm not, talking about gen, I'm not talking about genetical things. Some of it is in the physicality part, yes. Your genes affect you. Uh, epigenetics affects you. What your forefathers did affects you. Matter of fact, the third generation gets more affected by what our grandfathers did than what our fathers did. But by and large, what I'm talking about is your responsibility as a being that has a body, soul, and a spirit. That's the system. These are the systems I'm talking about. They have a focus. Every piece has a focus. Every, every one of them has a control, a force, and a result. So let's look at these. Your body is physical. It's concerned with self-protection. Primal response, self-protection. It's all about keeping you safe. It's about empowering you. It's about where's your power? How do you do this? It's about self-worthiness, getting worth, feeling good about yourself. They talk about self-esteem. Self-sufficiency, the, the body's about that. I want to be self-sufficient. I don't want somebody to have to take care of me. I want to take care of me. I want to do it myself. I'll do it myself. That's the flesh. Self-fulfillment. I, I want to gratify these desires. I want to gratify what I'm feeling. That's your physical body. The soul, I know you've heard it before, the body's the, the mind, will, and emotions. That's a simple way to say it. It's a little different than that. The soul itself is actually your life consciousness. It is the essence of you. It is your personhood. It's your personality. It's, it's who you are. When God says, I love you, he's talking about your soul. He's not talking about your great body. He's talking about your soul. I love you. It's, it's a, it is the thing that controls focus and attention, which is very important in just a minute. It is the one that directs the choices of the will. That is your soul. Uh, you know, in the Bible where it gets really confusing, there's verses in the scripture that really like you scratch your head. Like one in Romans, it says this. Before these two people, their brothers, before they did anything good, anything wrong, before they did anything at all, I loved Jacob. Before they were born, I hated Esau. I don't sound fair. God's talking about their essence, their soul. He's talking about who they are in personhood. Guess what? He created both of them. Now, you can get all into determination, determinism or predestination, get into all that. Don't try to burn your brain out doing that one. Just know God is faithful. Whatever God does is just and good. But they didn't do behavior. They weren't even alive yet. They weren't even born yet. He's I loved one and hated the other one. Before the foundation of the world. You were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Don't expect me to unpack that for you. He knows you. He knows your essence. He loves your soul. He's going after your soul. That's what he wants. Your spirit is the life gift, the life gift that comes directly from God. Everybody has a spirit. Some spirits that aren't connected to Jesus have not been born again. 
That's what's born again. The Spirit is born again. So what happens is when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you respond by faith. However that works, your spirit is made alive, and the Holy Spirit joins your spirit, dwells in your heart, the Bible says, in your heart, and that word in the Greek is cardio, in your heart, not your brain, in your heart. He dwells in your heart, Jesus does, by the Holy Spirit. When that is made alive, you are now a new creature, and that new creature has a unique ability it didn't have before to respond directly to God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, though, unregenerate, someone who doesn't know Christ, can still connect to the Spirit realm, but it doesn't connect to God's Spirit. There is power in the spirit realm. People use it for evil, they use it for good, but there is power in the, in the spirit realm. But what we're talking about for the believer is your spirit's been made alive, you have a new creature in you, and it responds to God. The focus of the body is always self. Feed me, feed me, feed me. I want to sleep. I don't want to get up. Feed me, feed me. I like that girl. I like that guy. All about self, 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 self. That's the flesh. The soul is bidirectional in that it can focus on the soul, or I'm on the self rather, or on God. It has a choice. That is where your choice comes in, it's in your soul. You can choose to serve your flesh and reap death, or you can serve the spirit and get life. The soul is bidirectional. It's given the ability of the will to give attention. That's really key. The spirit is a gift from God and it is made to connect with him. The spirit is very quiet. The body's really loud. I want food! The Spirit's like, you don't need that fifth bowl of ice cream. You know, you're the, you're the temple. You're my temple. Please try to take care of it a little bit. So, the controls. The body controls us by physical means. Physical, chemical, biochemical needs. Hormonal needs. Your emotional needs. The body does that. The body is controlled through physical, the soul with the mind. The mind control, the soul controls using the mind. It says, okay, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. That is an act of the mind to tell the mind to do something. The spirit is obviously connection. The control is connection, and that's the connection you want because that's where the power comes from. I don't know about you, but I can't change one, one little hair on my head. It takes the spirit of God. So the force the body uses the force of desire, desire and wants and needs. Some are legitimate. The force that the soul uses is the will. The will directs the mind. The will tells the mind, I want you to do this. And the Holy Spirit is the force that drives the spirit, which obviously is the most powerful and the one you want. Now the result. Obviously it's death by the, by the body, but it is life by the Spirit. But this is the one that's important, guys. This is the one we can, can work with. We can will ourselves. We can tell our mind, mind, I want you to focus your attention on something. It puts us in a position. This position that I'm talking about allows you to have power that you can't normally have just by your will exertion alone. You know, I tried to do what's right. It didn't work. So what you do is instead of doing the will, trying to do what's right, you take the will and you say, I want you to focus on this. And that attention... And that affection brings you into a position. Think of it like this, a bus stop. You go to a bus stop. You, you get around a little pole by the bus stop, right? There's no power in the bus stop. The power's in the design of the bus schedule and the bus. God is the bus. The schedule is the design. Be here at the bus stop at 10 o'clock. Bus comes, picks you up. And the bus is the power to do what God wants to do in your life. So the bus stop is the position. God puts you, gives you ways to get in the position. How do you say to do that? Draw near to God. Position yourself in him. He'll draw near to you. Position. It's not about will. It's not, I can do this. It's not, I can't do anything without God. Your attention and your affections leads to your direction. What you look at, what you desire, what you start looking at, and you cannot be looking at, I can, I can do this. I, I haven't looked at campers for a long time, but I can start looking at campers, RVs, and I can put me a little camper on the stove or on the refrigerator, and I just keep looking at it, and before too long, guess what happens? I am so provoked by the desires of my heart, by my body to go buy that camper, even when I know intellectually it's not right. I'll convince myself it's right. I'll convince my wife it's right. 
So what you put your attention to brings your affection to, therefore your direction goes. So when you come before God, you want your attention on Him and focus on Him. But remember, it's not your willpower. It's just your will to tell your mind where to go. <laughs> Literally. All right, let's look at this. Let's break it down. These are spiritual disciplines. I call them the spiritual life design protocols. First one is self-reductionism. Self-reduction goes kind of like this. Um, it's the tell your body no thing. You know what we do? We all do that. We're Americans. This is what we do. We spend every piece of money we got. We burn off all the emotional energy we have. We take all of our time and we squeak everything into that time. Some of you can't get your fingernails done because it stresses you out because you don't have time to get your fingernails done. No margin. No, no, no resiliency that comes by reserve. We have no mental reserve. We just burn it out. We go hard. We're hard chargers. We're Americans. We're going to get it done. We overachieve. And if we don't create that, that cushion in there by saying no, no, I really can't do that. Sometimes you hate that because you don't want people to think bad about you. Sometimes you just got to say no. No is a very healthy word. No, I, I really can't. I've got, I'm committed here and I can't do that. Self-reduction is in all ways. I have the right to do all things, Paul said, but I'll be mastered by none. I'll have the right. Is it wrong to drink wine? No. It's wrong to get drunk, but is it wrong to drink wine? Why don't I drink wine? Because I tell myself no for another reason. I'm a pastor, and I want to represent Christ well. I want to give a good example. It's not that I, I think, well, if you do that, you're a dirtbag. That's not it. I tell myself no. I have the freedom. No. Huh? Everybody else is doing it. No. I know that I need over seven hours of sleep at night. I know that biologically, chemically. I know you need that. So instead of saying, I'm going to watch another movie, I say, no. I go to bed. There's all different ways you can use this. And spiritually speaking, there's many ways. A lot of them have to do with these next particular subjects. Sabbath. We are all Sabbath breakers. But what I want you to think of the Sabbath is from now on is not a day. It is an attitude. It is attention and direction. Can you give God the Sabbath by your attention and your affection? So what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is when you do something in your life that's not mowing grass, unless that will give you attention and affection for your Father in heaven instead of your yard looking good for the neighbors. It could mean that your Sabbath includes working with your family and spending time with the family, affection for God, attention with God, with your family. It could be that you just get alone for a while, but the Bible, God designed you this way. You got to have the Sabbath. And it's not a day. Matter of fact, we're supposed to go in Christ to create all these reserves in our life to realize we're crucified with Christ so that when we go out, we got all this reserve. When somebody asks you to do something, you got time reserve. You got all these things. The Sabbath, God says, you need me. Matter of fact, when he made the Ten Commandments, he tithed to you. He gave one of the Ten Commandments for you, which is the Sabbath. Sabbath's not made for the man. It's not a list of rules for you to do. It's for you to refocus your attention on me, and I want to do it one day a week. But realistically, if you do the time crunching on this, if you sleep seven, eight hours a night, that one day is actually the time frame of 16.8 hours a day, or in a day, for that activity, minus the sleep. That's one-tenth of your week goes back to God to reconnect to him. He gives you one-tenth. He asked for one-tenth back. He says, you need it. You need it. He's not like, you better do this. I'm going to smash you and throw you in hell because you're breaking the Sabbath. It's like, you need, guys, you're spiritual. You have a spirit in you. You've got to reconnect the spirit to God in a very d definitive way. Going to church is one. Going to church is, are you, are you giving God attention? I hope so. When we're worshiping, are you adoring him? I hope so. That puts you in a position to receive power. That's why going to church is important. Solitude is important. Some people like this one. Uh, I like solitude because it allows me to do some other things with God in my own heart. But solitude, some people, you are addicted to people. God wants you addicted to him first. Not wrong to need people, but get away, get with God, be in solitude with him. 
Meditation is another one. And I'm not talking about Eastern meditation. I'm talking about taking this left brain material called the Word of God, incarnating it over to the right, get it down in your heart that you may not sin against Him. It is, it is a meditation of chewing the Word of God. Chew, 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 chew. I had to meditate on the Scripture that Jesus gave me. I didn't know what that... I don't know all this stuff from seminary. What does that mean? I never thought of it that way. Lead us not to temptation. I better look at that. I meditate, meditate, chew on it, look at it. Get the Greek out if I have to, but just look at it, think about it. Look at the Greek, then go meditate on it, think about it. I had to do that. But there's also connectivity. Connectivity with God, for sure, in the Sabbath. Other parts of the day, you're supposed to not have one day a week. Every day you're supposed to connect to Jesus, right? Pray without ceasing. You're supposed to live as a follower of Jesus every day of your life. But you also connect to other believers. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger brain, even. We need one another. We interact and bump off of each other's brains all the time. It's called interpersonal neurobiology. We connect with one another just by being in the presence, seeing the facial expressions. I got a ton of scriptures that have to deal with that, but I don't have time to share it. But it is in the face of Jesus, which is the feeling part of God, that you receive certain freedom, connectivity. Contemplation. Well, what's the difference between contemplation and meditation? You can contemplate driving down the road. You can contemplate running. I, I put my headphones on. I got blaring rock Christian music in my ears, and I can run, and I can contemplate on a particular thing. It's usually not deep like medica- meditation, but it's like, I'm thinking about this. Yeah, God, and I can run because I turn my physical body. I'm really saying no to the activity the brain wants to go, and I'm making it fo- focus on God, even though the physical body's moving. It's okay. I can multitask. Connect- contemplation. And lastly, munificence is just a fancy word for God-type generosity. Being generous with money, time, with other people, giving it away. The, the entire universe is designed on this principle. The entire universe is about giving, not getting. The flesh, though, wants to get because we're fallen. When we come in community with people and we give like God gives, like we give special grace to that person that you really don't like. You ever had that? I mean, that one person that just, I don't like that person. You actually help them? It'll do wonders for your life. It'll do wonders for your spiritual life. You're wired to be like your Father in heaven who is kind to the ungrateful. He is kind to those who don't deserve it. He is kind to the abusers. He's the kind of those who smack them in the face. That's munificence. And we need to realize that that is a spiritual discipline. You know, you can go ahead and stand and we'll get ready to close here, but if you're able, um, there's a man, he's a famous philosopher. He's passed away now as a theologian. His name is Dallas Willard. And a lot of stuff he says, I'm kind of like, well, I don't really know about all that, but he is a, a great man of God. And a pastor came and asked Dallas, said, Dallas, I want to grow spiritually. I want to be a good pastor, but he struggled with the same things Paul was. I do the very thing I hate, and I can't really seem to get my life together. He said this one thing. You need to radically eliminate hurry out of your life. That what you do, you do through self-control. You do with, with the ability to stop, listen to God. That's what the Sabbath is about. That's what connection with Him is about radically eliminate hurry out of your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for grace. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for power, Lord. I thank you that you have not left us here all in ourselves. You've given us the design. You told us what to do. You told us there are influences that lead us into temptation. Father, help us to trust you and position ourselves through our attention and our affections that we might receive the power of the Holy Spirit to do this thing called life. Give us this, Father. Your kingdom needs it. Your people need it. Father, allow us to see our lives finish well in the name of Jesus as we compete according to the designs of God. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys.